House Ways and Means, Tuesday, April 19th. Um, and we are um, taking up three different issues this morning. The first one um, is going to be an uh, update on revenue uh, for both fiscal 20 and 21 um, that Graham uh, and Mark will walk us through. And this is um, uh, a consensus forecast, I believe. Um, the last one we had was not consensus. It was just Tom Cavett. And Tom Cavett is available by phone if we need him. Um, then we're going to look at a bill, S-283, which is the Hartford TIF. They have asked for an extension. I'll let them explain why they need it. it has passed the Senate. It's been in our committee um, since before we left the building, March 13th. That so is this date that um, I time things from before the 13th and after the 13th. We've had that spill for a while. Um, and then we're going to look at H716, which is a bill that would give hunting and fishing licenses to uh, Native Americans. Um, it's a bill uh, for free. And um, it's a bill that came to our committee on March 12th. So um, when I was first asked about it, I didn't realize we even had it in the committee because um, once it had arrived there under Rule 35A and I just wasn't aware that it had, had gone in there. So um, we'll hear about that bill um, and that will be our morning. So um, with that, uh, Graham, I think, are, are you the one who's going to start us off? I believe so. Well, let me first, I should first ask if the committee has, if anyone on the committee has an announcement or something they want to um, put on the table before we get rolling. Is that, okay, go ahead, Graham. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Graham Campbell from the Joint Fiscal Office. Or should would you mind putting up the document um, that I sent you this morning? Also a public shout out to Sorsha for the many changes to this document that occurred <laughs> between last night and this morning that she had to post multiple times. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, uh, the updated revenue forecast that, it, at, like Madam Chair said, was consensus between Tom Cavett and Jeff Carr of the administration. This is an update uh, for all three funds and it's fiscal 2021 and we got our first glimpse at fiscal year 22 as well. So I'll be walking through that. The, the summer, the main sort of headline summary here is that the, the numbers in, by certain standards, but, the, but in terms of the size of the revenue downgrades we've seen are not actually, it's a relatively small update, um, but in sort of regular world terms, we're talking, you know, five to $15 million. So large, depending upon how you think about it, but in terms of the dollars we've been seeing, not super significant. So I'll begin with fiscal 20 here. Um, the total uh, revenue downgrades across all three funds total about $143 million. That number last forecast on April 28th was $146 million. So a very modest improvement for fiscal 20. The general funds expected to be $46 million to the red. Um, and that does not include the direct app that we receive on the property transfer tax. And so that is an additional roughly $2.8 million. So the true number- Graham, 2.8 million up or down? Uh, additional down. So the real number here should be about 49-ish million dollars. Um, the transportation fund down about 42 million. Oh, sorry, I should say that the, the general fund number back on April 28th was 48, negative 48. So it's roughly the same. The transportation fund um, is now estimated to be negatively impacted by COVID-19 to the tune of $42 million. That number was 44 million back on April 28th. So it's a little bit better. And the education fund um, is basically the same as it was on April 28th, down 55 million. And that number was 54 million on um, April 28th. So it's a million dollars worse than it was on April 28th. May I ask a question? Why are we waiting on the uh, property transfer tax? It, because it's a direct app and it doesn't go into the other? Well, maybe I did. Yeah, perhaps I didn't explain this very well. So the property transfer tax is one of the wackiest taxes that we have where it starts with the, the general property transfer tax and then statutorily 
the first two and a half million comes off for debt service for the housing bond that was passed a couple of years ago. And then with it, there are statutory percentages in terms of diversion of revenue, um, but we notwithstand that every year. And so uh, the Department of Taxes gets a, a small chunk in statutes, about 2%, but which would work out to about 850,000, but they, we have only appropriated about 500 or so thousand to them. VHCB gets, um, I think it's, let me see here, uh, about 50% of the remaining revenue, but they, that's not withstood. And then the municipal and regional planning board gets 17% according to the statute, but that's not withstood. So essentially what happens is we say, VHCB, municipal planning board, and department of taxes will get a set amount that we specify in the budget and the rest of it just flows to the general fund. What Tom does here is he um, produces a downgrade for the property transfer tax as a whole, and then he uses the statutory percentages, but the actual loss to the general fund is, is really what is left over after the, we account for those, um, what's actually put into the budget. So in the budget last year, we put in a certain amount for those other areas. And so essentially any loss that happens in the property transfer tax will be borne by the general fund, both through its statutory percentage, plus um, any of the remaining, what we call the direct app that's left over after the other three um, parties get their, their portion. So that total loss, Tom is projecting at about 4.3 million and that, is basically all borne by the general fund. But what he shows in his tables is only the 33% of that, which is the general fund share, but in reality, it's greater than that. So kind of a long-winded explanation to say that the property transfer tax loss is mostly, is all borne by the general fund. And so the 46 number that you see here is actually more negative. It's about 49 once we account for that direct app part. Okay, I, I was just curious why we why we waited on it, but I think I think I understand because it's a direct app. It's it's what gets left on the bottom line at the end. Yes, right. exactly. Okay. Thanks. Um, other questions on fiscal twenty from anybody? Um, I don't think so. So let's go on to twenty one. Unless you have other, other notes that you wanted to go over. Um, we no, I just have the notes there at the addition. We have yeah. some deferrals going on still. Um, I know that a small update that I've heard from Tom um, on the meals and rooms and sales and use tax is that the interest and penalties on those were waived for the March and April payments. So we should be getting those, those deferred payments on May 25th. And it's my understanding that after speaking with the Department of Taxes, the two economists have sort of counted most of those deferrals as showing up in fiscal 20. So there's not much deferral revenue loss um, accounted for. And you see that sort of at the bottom line of the table here in fiscal 21, the actual deferral here is only 6 million. Um, whereas that number used to be as high as 40 million in previous forecasts, because there was the assumption that the administration might extend this or people might not pay. And it seems as though they've, they've changed their thinking on that, um, that that money will, most of it will show up before the end of fiscal year 20 close out. Do we know that the deferral won't be extended or is that just um, built into what the economists have agreed on? I, I don't know for sure that answer. I think it's just, when I spoke to Tom, that was the assumption that they're making is that that money will be mostly paid before the end of close out. So the end of, um, the fiscal year. Okay. Anyone, any other questions anyone has? Okay. So moving on to fiscal 21. Over here. So the current, the, the newest forecast has total revenue downgrades across all three funds of just about $378 million. Um, that is better than it was um, on April 28th. That number was $430 million. So we are just under $60 million better in fiscal year 21. Um, 
going across all three funds, the revenue loss in fiscal 21 relative to the January forecast for fiscal 21 um, is down $230 million roughly. That number was $266 million in April, um, late April. So about $36 million better than it was. The transportation fund is down um, about $47 million um, in this current iteration. That number was $52 million in April 28th. So a small amount better there. And the education fund is down about $100 million in fiscal 21. And that's just the non-property tax revenues. And that number was $113 million in April. So we're about $13 million better than we thought um, in the education fund. Mm -hmm. So, and then the additional note there is that any revenues that actually um, uh, defer revenues that are that were received after July 30th will sort of uh, will increase the revenue loss in 20, but will, will increase the available revenues in fiscal 21. So the extent that monies aren't actually paid in, before the closeout, they'll actually increase revenues in fiscal 21. So less of a deal though now because they're starting to assume that most of those deferred revenues um, will actually be counted in fiscal 20. So just flagging that for the committee. So um, so the question I've got, um, I, I'm thinking, I'm looking particularly at the sales tax, but I guess it applies to rooms and meals as well, um, is, the uh, slightly improved, well, actually it's improved by close to 13%. It's not so slight, at least on the Fed fund side. Um, is that improved picture because of a change in economic activity or is it a change in the information that was available um, and not reflective of um, underlying economic activity? Or do you know? I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I, I know that the numbers um, are up because the meals and the sales tax numbers are better than they were in April, but I don't know whether Tom and Jeff have received better economic information from the people from the contract with Moody's, whether they receive better information. But I imagine a good uh, uh, some of that is probably due to more information they have from the, at least from the April payments. So they, they look, look probably more at the larger payers. This mm -hmm. is typically the process that they do. They look at the larger payers and see how much they paid um, and get a sense of how much they are struggling in this environment. And then they revise the forecast. So I imagine it's, it might be both, um, but I can't say for sure. I saw information somewhere. I think, I think you, I think you and I exchanged a note about it, about, um, uh, the uh, online sales, which had been, I think, I, I'm going to get the figures wrong, but 13% of the total um, in March and April, this is national figures, in March and April were 30%. They'd gone from 13 to 30%. So, did I get the figures right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I remember too. Um, yeah, some very large um, online sales activity going on. In Vermont, it's about 11% of pre-COVID sales were... 11% of pre-COVID sales were online. And so I yes. imagine that percentage has gone up, but we don't know what the specific figure is. Um, yeah, but if it's comparable, if it went from 11% to 25% or something like that, I mean, those those increases are huge. And, and that's all money we collect. Yeah. Because the, yeah. So, um, so yeah, would, it, it's a blessing that this committee and the, or this legislature passed the Marketplace Facilitator Bill when they did. Um, and then also that the Wayfair decision came down yeah. what, about two years ago, yeah. um, or else this would have been much more difficult um, of a situation for the state. Yeah. Uh, committee members, questions for Graham um, or questions for Tom Cavett that you want to loop him in? To um, Scott, are you uh, um, jumping in? I'm trying. <laughs> you go ahead then. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sure looking for blue hands and I didn't see one, but I see that you turned on your mic. So yeah. Um Graham, and I I know you probably don't know this number right now, but I'm I'm curious about that that movement of thirteen million dollars in the consumption taxes, how that breaks down as far as sales tax and rooms and meals tax. 
Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I can I can follow up with you um, after this and let you know. Okay, the that'd be great. Are. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, Sarsha sent me a note that Tom Cavett is on the call. Um, I, I, I may ask him the same question. We can ask him the question Scott just asked about the breakdown between rooms and meals and sales. And um, Tom, if you're there, I, I'm also, um, I don't see that you're here. There he is. Okay. I'm on. There you are. Um, uh, the question about how much of the improved uh, estimate is is uh, information about underlying economic activity or just better data. Um, okay. So when you say improved, it's you're talking about relative to the last round because yeah. some things are worse and some things are better. Yeah. I'm looking specifically at sales tax because uh, I'm sort of focused on the on the education fund at the moment. Yeah, so the the both sales tax and meals and rooms, um, uh, you know, we have we have scant information because of the deferral issue that um, uh, you know is not giving us complete information, <clears throat> and then the information we have is likely to be from firms that are better off. Um, but if we we just learned prior to doing this that. There will not be deferrals this month and next month. That was the original assumption uh, was that was going to continue. Uh, and, and, it, and presumably all of it would be due in July. And then that could be counted and recaptured in the current fiscal year. Now the assumption is the, uh, the, the money that's been deferred for March and April uh, will not be captured in FY20. That's going to go to 21. And, but we will get uh, 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 May and June revenues uh, with full detail. So in terms of analysis, we'll have a better picture on that. But what we've been doing is going through all of the um, April data, trying to find, you know, so, so we have all payers and then we're looking at those that filed but didn't pay and those that didn't file and didn't pay and those that paid right through. And so that's where we've made some adjustments based on that. Um, I think that's probably, that's probably nudged the numbers up a little bit. They might still go up as we get more information. Because of the, the deferral uh, situation, uh, it left us without a lot of basic data that we would otherwise be using to inform this. Yeah. Um, and the question Scott asked about how much of the um, change in the education fund is meals and rooms and how much is sales tax. Did I get that right, Scott? Yes, you got it right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd have to go back and look at the prior sheet that you're comparing it to. We do sort of a rolling update, and then periodically, when we're asked, we kick out the sheet. So I, you know, every two or three days, we'll have different numbers, but um, but but we don't always, you know, print them out and release them. So maybe Graham, you could just look and see relative to the last time uh, this was presented, uh, uh, which numbers are higher or lower. Um, you know, with, with meals and rooms and sales and use. I suspect most of it would have been sales and use, but I'm not sure the reference point. Involved. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I've pulled it up while we've been talking. So sales tax is about $9 million better than it was on the April 29th forecast. And meals and rooms is about $3 million better, or sorry, yeah, about $3 million better. Um, so it's it's mostly sales and a little bit of meals. Around. On the other hand, proportionately, that's a much better increase in rooms meals because yeah, the baby is yeah. so much smaller. Yeah. But yeah, I'm pretty much the only thing going on in rooms and meals now. Of course, is yeah. the is the yes. meals part. There's very little in the way of rooms, and yeah. the opening up too. That you know that that improved some of the June numbers, but really, the restrictions around. Uh, tourism visitation, the, the you know two-week quarantine 
effectively makes that impossible. So you might as well say you're closed. However, uh, uh, in conversations with Commissioner uh, Pichik on Friday, he said that he felt testing was getting to the point where people might be able to come in, have a test done, or have a test done right before they leave whatever state they're coming from. Uh, and if they quarantine between the time the test was done and the test results came out, which now can be 48 hours, um, maybe 72, depending on the test and all, but uh, then they could uh, uh, immediately uh, be able to uh, register to stay in Vermont. So anyway, that's still uh, problematic, but some of the other reopening was a little bit earlier than we had assumed before. So some of the gas tax stuff and things like that, um, June is a little bit better. Uh, committee, anyone? I have I have one other question. I think it goes to the deferrals, um, sort of the way those are playing out. Um, and I have to admit, I get confused about the month that the tax was owed and the month that it's paid. I mean, where the economic activity is and when the when the return right. comes in. But um, the question is really looking at the education fund and trying to understand. Um, exactly how much of a problem we have to solve in fiscal 21. Um, how uh, is it really going to be? Uh, um, are we, so the, the question really is when are we going to have figures that we can be reasonably confident about? And is that the August forecast or are we um, because of the way the deferrals are going to work or is that, um, is that earlier, is that before July 1? Um, yeah, good, good question, because we don't know really the scope of, you know, the deferrals in terms of the actual money. All we have are counts. Um, so we'd have to do some kind of formulaic projection by pair and then, you know, get a rough idea. But it, it's that would that's that's really fraught until we get it. I'm hopeful that the tax commissioner would say, you know, this is due. I mean, they 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 said they need to send a letter with 30 days advance notice. So if that were done soon, that could even be FY20 money. That would be the best. Uh, I mean, it's it's money that's already collected from the consumers who pay it right. and just held. So yeah, it's for activity in February and March, and only half of March was heavily affected. Um, but I. Uh, I, otherwise, I don't know when they're going to send the letter and then when the payments are made. Um, maybe, too, that the longer that you wait, some of those companies may not have the capacity to, to pay if they've used that money for something else down mm -hmm. the road. Um, so it's hard to say. With the reason we were saying do a September update uh, is because at the end of July, we'll have the personal income tax stuff, which is the enormous, you know, revenue swing. And that would take some time in August for the tax department to process. And then if we did a September update, that would be a, a you know, a, a relevant point in time where we'd know a lot more. Hopefully we know a lot more about sales and use of meals and rooms by then too. But um, uh, it's up to the commissioners when he, wants that money to, to be due. Um, thank you. Questions? Oh, okay. Tom, thank you. Uh, and where was it? So far, each time I've gotten an update, it's slightly better. So that's good. Um, and um, we'll continue to try to get a, a good read on on what's going on, particularly before we take action. Um, I think, Graham, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, yes, uh, fiscal year 22. Ah, okay. <laughs> Another year. Another um, year, gosh, okay. Yeah, so I, I think the, the primary purpose of looking at fiscal 22 is getting a sense of you know, once we sort of hit rock bottom, what's it look like on the other side, potentially, just to give us an idea of how we might handle fiscal 21. Um, and I think the overall story here is that there is 
um, a modest bounce back in revenues. Although I'll show you some charts later to show that you know it's kind of good news, bad news, depending upon how you want to spin it. But overall, relative to what we had in this for fiscal 22 in the January forecast, revenues are down 220 million, um, wow. and that's obviously spread across the three funds, 141 in the, in the general fund, um, 21 and a half in the transportation fund, and they're 57 and 0.4 in the education fund. And so that, as you can see in the year over year percentage change line there at the bottom, that's across all three funds, but 9.2 percentage growth from fiscal 21. Um, so a, a bounce back, um, but fiscal year 21 is kind of sort of the low point here. So you're bouncing back from a low base. And so that's um, sort of the main story there. So should we just scroll down to some of the charts here? I'll show you how that sort of looks like, uh, how these sort of look like graphically. So the general fund here, the blue line shows you essentially what available general fund revenue um, from fiscal 17 through forecast of fiscal 22. Um, and the blue line is what we had in the January forecast. The red dotted line is what we now think um, we will have um, for available general fund revenue. And so you can see um, fiscal 21 is a precipitous drop in revenue. And then we received sort of a, a small bounce back in fiscal um, 22. And so um, it, it's a somewhat I guess positive improvement there, but another story you might say is if you look at the endpoint of fiscal 22, it is lower than the total gen available general fund revenue we had in fiscal 17. So we have a bounce back, but our revenues basically are what they were five years ago in the general fund available. Um, Robin's got a question. Did you want to jump in, Robin? I'll wait till we get to the Ed fund. Okay. Transportation funds, kind of the same story. This, the chart there, um, it, we see sort of a small bounce back, but fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 are roughly the same amount of revenue um, in that fund. And then we, were, we we get the bounce back. But again, even once we get that bounce back in fiscal 22, we're talking about fiscal year 17 levels of revenue in the transportation fund. So I guess you could say that the, the the epidemic is set back of revenues in these two funds almost five years. Um, and then the education fund, things are actually a little bit better. Um, so um, to make this a little bit more comparable, um, I added 100% of the sales tax and 25% of the meals and rooms tax for fiscal year 17 and 18, even though that um, percentage split didn't occur in those fiscal years, we had a general fund transfer, but just to, for a little bit of comparability. So this may not be exact, exact amounts for non-property uh, non tax education fund revenues, but it's relatively close. Um, but you can see, we, we see the big drop in fiscal 21 with the rebound. So the education fund at least will sort of rebound to its fiscal 19 levels of revenue by fiscal 22 for non-property tax, uh, non tax um, revenue sources. So. A little bit better situation there. So I wonder why it feels like such bad news. <laughs> sure. so I said, it's good. It's good news and bad news, depending on how you want to spin it. Yeah, uh, Robin. Um, thank you, um, Graham. You, you answered part of my question um, because this is non-property tax education fund revenues. But I'm wondering how you're starting to think about the income sensitivity and property tax credits that are going to affect FY22 because of the way we account for them. And that's the year that's really gonna get hit by that. Have you, is this too early to start asking those questions or are you thinking about that? I think Mark will have good answers for that. Okay. Um, I think he's the best person to ask about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Mark, are we shifting to you? At, oh, Emily, go ahead. Thanks. Um, are all of these models built on the assumption that we're not gonna have another shut down i would i think i would defer to tom on that um i don't know what the assumptions are whether there's a resurgence in the, in 
the virus or not? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, there, the, the assumption is there is not a, a second complete shutdown. So, you know, there, there are tremendous unknowns about this. And it's not like an economic model is going to tell you what this path is. It's an epidemiological model. And um, the, the information to date has been so limited with the testing that's improving all the time. So as more data comes in, more will be known about transmission characteristics and you know, uh, uh, risks of a second wave. <clears throat> I think those risks are substantial from, from everything I know now. Um, but that's why these are important to view as order of magnitude type estimates. And not only does FY20 change all the time, 21 and 22, you know, potential ranges are huge. This is not like a normal revenue forecast we have, where we have relatively tight bands around um, the risk elements because this is an epidemiological event primarily with huge economic consequences. It's not an economic collapse based on any economic fundamentals. So that's a risk going forward. Uh, okay, I think I think we'll go to Mark, um, and you're going to talk about. Uh, are you going to present the Ed fund balance sheet now? Is yep. that the idea? Yeah. Sure. Good morning, everybody. I I, I can. Um, th this is pretty straightforward for the education fund, but we can go over the balance sheet. Um, to, to answer Representative Shy's um, question. I think um, we haven't done any, I don't think we've done any analysis on what the property tax adjustment would look like in 22 yet, but you're right, there's a concern there because for FY22, household income would be based on calendar year 20. So that would reflect the, the significant downgrade in people's incomes. Offsetting that to some extent, however, will be um, household income is defined very, very broadly. So it'll include unemployment insurance compensation, and I think the other monies that are coming out from the federal government. So household income is a really broad definition of income. So it will it will include more than just people's actual wages and salaries um, during during that period. Um, but we we haven't looked ahead. I would expect it to grow. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, on the education fund outlook, um, the revenue upgrade you just re were presented with goes from 20 to 22. We're only looking at FY20 and 21 here. Um, so if you can page down to the bottom, I think this is pretty straightforward and we can just show what's going on here. So um, all of the changes to the education fund have come on the sales and use, purchase and use and meals and rooms taxes. So this is just three sources to the education fund that are affected. For FY20, um, the forecast is a little bit worse so that where we initially had a $3.7 million deficit to carry forward from FY20 into FY21, we're now showing a $4.6 million deficit that needs to get carried forward. You can see that on line 26. So a little worse there and that carries right through these three examples um, that we've been looking at. And then in FY21, the forecast improves so where we had been looking at um, line 31, a current year unallocated net reserve, basically a deficit of $166.7 million, we're now looking at $155 million. So not usually different, but it's an improvement. And um, I don't know if we'll be going out to FY22 at some point, I haven't thought about it, but it's, it's possible that we could try to carry out the fund another year and just see what's what's going on there. But it's, it gets really speculative because of the spending and all that. Uh, and, the, and the issue Robin raised about income sensitivity. And income sensitivity, yeah. I yeah. think the big one would be what we really hard to just decide what schools and voters are going to decide they can spend yeah. in FY22. It will depend on, you know, how this pandemic rolls out over the next six months or so. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, questions for Mark. So when, uh, um, when we've been talking about a $167 million problem to solve, we're now talking about a $155 million problem to solve. Not that that's yes. simple and easy, but um, let's say as we, as we learn more, uh, I'm glad to see that the number is not growing. It's shrinking. It's not shrinking a lot. 
but it's shrinking. Um, so that is, um, that's good news among the bad. Um, let me see if people have questions. I don't think so. Um, anybody want to jump in? Great. Um, so we're going to look at Ed Finance again tomorrow. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to spend more time on it this morning, um, other than to say thank you to Tom and Graham and Mark. Um, and um, then, so we're going to shift gears.